tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 5, Episode 25, which also happens to be the 123rd episode of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Hey, Heartlanders, you guys patrons yet? Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to join the club. You'll get ad-free versions of this and all our other podcasts, including hundreds of standalone releases from our audio archives dating back to 2012. It's a great way to show your support, and you get a whole lot for it. As I alluded to last week, Fear from the Heartland will be on hiatus. While I'm not 100% sure of its status, I can tell you that I will be on Wednesday nights for the foreseeable future on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. As I mentioned in the opening, all previous episodes will be on this channel to download. You can also find me on Facebook and Instagram, as well as paulsbooks.net, if you are interested in an audiobook. I cannot tell you what a pleasure... Wait, the hell I can't. I can tell you that it has been an utmost pleasure to engage with the fans to this show, many of whom are very special to me, I think you know who you are, as we have conversed mightily in the comments section for five seasons now. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. You have made this an endearing time for me. A special shout out as well to the authors of this show, whom I have been so fortunate to work with, and so many I now consider friends. Thanks also to Craig Groshek, President and CEO of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, who is a mentor and friend and believed in me to give me my very own show. Also, N.M. Brown, COO, for your constant support and help. Also a shout out to my buddy, Jeff Sturdivant, who's always available to me to bounce ideas off of. I, of course, have possibly saved the best for last. My producer and cohort in crime, my wifey, Nikki McSorley. Your support, love, and kick-ass productions could no way make me prouder. Thank you, baby. So with all of this, I am excited to tell you that tonight's first story is by Eli Pope. And with this, his 32nd story makes him number one as far as author stories on Fear from the Heartland. Tonight's final story is by Ashley Fontaine, whose story, Stained Concrete, was the first to air on Friday the 13th in August 2021. One more thing to say. Let's get after it. Oh, Santa is pissed. He is worn out, spent, and just can't possibly care any less. He doesn't want to do his job anymore and believes he's come up with an exit strategy. But to whose detriment? His? Ours? Both? And now, for your indulgence, The Night Santa Wasn't Jolly by Eli Pope. (laughs) 
one. When are you going to stop moping around and get those damn elves of yours online? Christmas is around the corner, Santa. Put the bourbon down, pull up your pants, and get into the dang spirit of toy making. You got kids counting on you. Nag, nag, nag. That's all that woman does these days. A little incentive, Mrs. Claus, would go a long damn ways. Maybe a breast poking through the red velvet. A little twerking of your big buns while you're out baking candies and cookies. Just saying. Sometimes a man needs a little visual motivation. A little poke in the right ways and direction. I knew nothing would come of it. We were in a rut. Not a good rut either, like my reindeer during mating season. As I attempted to sit up, the almost empty bottle of my Christmas spirits, labeled Maker's Mark, rolled over the edge of the bed and hit the floor, shattering into shards. Damn it! Broke from my lips like a well-practiced shot at breaking up the pool rack with my cue. I was in a hole. I was grumpy, tired, and well... Horny as hell. But I felt a little dumpier. I had added a couple of pounds over the year, and I'm a little self-conscious about the dicky do, if you know what I'm talking about. And well, the missus isn't getting any friskier. In all the reflection, I totally forgot about the busted bottle on the floor as my round, swollen feet hit the wooden boards with a loud creak followed by my very loud scream of obscenities. Santa, what in the world is going on in here? She paused as she rounded the corner of the bed and saw the blood oozing into a puddle around my feet and the broken glass. I'll get a towel, lay back down and we'll clean you up. Of all the stupid... Yeah, I heard her true sentiments. She rounded the corner into the bathroom, still mumbling about my age was becoming a problem. Something about my early onset dementia. She was such a hateful woman at times. After picking the glass out of my feet and wrapping them with gauze and tape, I painfully squeezed my boots on and gingerly pranced out to the kitchen. My head was throbbing from the bourbon, feet stinging from the glass, Pride killed by the struggle of nearly losing the battle of buckling my belt. And to top it off, as fat as I was, I was as hungry as a starving badger ready to fight a six-foot cobra for an overstuffed rat. Yeah, the holiday season was upon me. It may be time to retire this sweet gig. Two. I hobbled out to the garage, wading through reindeer droppings, dodging the different clumps of shit. Sad thing was, I knew all my reindeer so well that I could tell which mess was from who by its color and consistency. Sick, right? Well, after all these years with nobody else stepping up to the plate to take over, this is the life I'm stuck with. Bringing joy to all the girls and boys for, like, forever. Always the giver, never the receiver. In today's world of not being able to discipline your kids without a DFS agent being called, afraid to hurt anybody's little caring feelings, and nobody wanting to freaking work anymore since COVID? But I digress. It was just about then that the smell hit me like a fart under the covers sent by the Mrs. Chubby Cheeks herself. I looked down. Damn you, Donner! Out of all these landmines willy-nilly laid over the entire yard, I have to land in yours? I shook my head in disgust as I fought the urge to puke. Wiping my boot in the freshly fallen snow, 
and then stomping it until the pain from the earlier shards of glass shot up my last nerves and then dropping me to the ground and rolling me over to my back in distress. That's when I'd suddenly understood the mistake of my carelessness. I don't know if you ever smelled reindeer shit, but I can tell you, it makes hard-boiled egg farts smell like roses in comparison. I laid on the ground afraid to move a muscle. My life had literally fallen into shit. What to do, what to do. This day could go from bad to dangerous in a New York minute. Murray! I shouted at the top of my lungs as my jolly ass stomach attempted to refrain from throwing up from the smell of the dung I was most certainly wearing now, like a Claude Monet impressionistic painting of brown excrement and red velvet. I pulled my belly up from my waistline, just enough to slip my hand into my front pocket and fish my cell phone out. I gotta go on a diet, I told myself as gently as I could while I fat-thumbed my wife's digits on the tiny number pads. The second ring, I can't believe it, I do declare. Honey, I've gotten myself into a bit of a jam, sweetheart. A shit jam for certain tried to calm my demeanor in an attempt to beg her help without getting the usual all-knowing women's aspect that I knew once she made it out here to help me up, I would receive in full dosage. This day is crap, Mary, I swear. This is my last year. We have to find my replacement before I go full-on rage. I'm serious this time. I need to lay on a turquoise beach in Cancun sipping brightly colored umbrella drinks and smoking tie stick. It's time, Mary Jane Claus. I'll be right out, Chris. I know you are no longer the Chris Kringle I met back then. We'll figure something out, I promise. I sighed with a breath of relief in just hearing her words of understanding. No, I wasn't Chris Kringle anymore. That man was 120, er... 40 some odd pounds ago. A once brown haired ladies' man with a penchant for wild, crazy sex with the aid of a drawer full of sex toys instead of a bottle of blue pills to bring things on the stiff. Too bad I was shooting blanks all those years, because now I'm stuck with no son to leave this wonderful legacy with. I shook my head in dismay as I lay and stared on what was once the equivalent of a hot rod garage. And I'm not even able to pick myself up on my own. And the smell! Damn! From gasoline to slimy green. Oh, the days for horsepower instead of organic and renewable reindeer energy. Bah humbug! Three. Thanks to the wife, I was able to get up and get changed into more appropriate work attire. My black Harley Davidson leathers. I grunted to myself as I caught a glimpse in the mirror. Even a fat bastard looks tough in black leather, if he's sporting a long white beard and a few tattoos. I don't know how I caved into trading this in on red velvet with white fur. Must have been some sort of hidden agenda of Martha's, my first wife. She was always wanting to stand up for some underprivileged and misunderstood soul. After surveying the old sleigh in the garage, I realized I must have taken her out for yet another spin after enjoying some libation consumption last New Year's Eve over at the Grinch's place. Bent fenders and a chipped rails must have attempted a dry run across the tundra to the North Pole Tavern before the last heavy snow. I had work to do, and I still had to give a stern pep talk to the now unionized elf laborers at the factory. Good help was hard to find, especially with the union's restrictions on anyone over 39 inches tall. What's this world coming to? A man can't run a business anymore even if it is a 5013C nonprofit. 
Okay, um, toy, menu, uh, labors of elves. Damn! I paused after stumbling my opening sentence as I looked to my CFO, Mrs. Claus. I turned as I covered the microphone. What the hell do... How do I, um, address our toy makers? All these damn regulations and rules. I'm not allowed to call them elves anymore. What the hell are they now? I mean, the Washington Commanders for crying out loud. We all know they're really still the Redskins. All of this political correctness. How about fellow talented toy manufacturing specialists? That will make them feel as if they are not only valued, but also equal. Mrs. Claus smiled as she waved to the gathered employees before turning back and winking at me. Fellow talented toy manufacturers, dear friends and... I quietly said the words, backstabbing profiteers under my breath before recouping my composure and continuing with and practically family for all these years. I turned to roll my eyes, thinking what they really were. Yellow-bellied turncoats who had done what the rest of the country's workers had done. Unionized to boost their collective hold over production and growth, and then after COVID, used it to squeeze sympathy money from the government. It was all because of the damned commercialization of Christmas that led me into being shafted. Who in hell was fighting for me? I'm still the one and only pissant with his balls dangling over the barbed wire, dragging my ass all over the world in one confounded night of joyous hell on the coldest eve of the year, professionally landing my vintage broken down delivery craft onto slippery rooftops using a nine member flight crew of creatures that shit everywhere, they're parked while I alone drag the bag of overpriced toys down tight and nasty soot-filled tubes that are usually still flame-filled with hot embers from toasting graham crackers and marshmallows while they get sloshed enjoying their vodka-spiked hot chocolates. Merry Christmas. Ah, humba. The Grinch was right before he bought into the well-plotted farce to put smiles on faces to mask the normal daily grumbles of life. You have been a well-oiled team of talent for many years. I stacked the mind-numbing BS on thicker than honey on a queen bee's bed in order to sweeten their egos enough to get what I needed this last year. Without letting them know, they'd likely all be out of work and living on Skid Row in Fairbanks, Alaska by this time next year. It's crunch time once again. A time we all need to pull together and pool our strengths to meet this crazy demand of the holidays. I know we can do it. We somehow come through every year, and this one will be no different. I'm hoping for generous bonuses for all after we wind down. We are looking good for raises coming next spring, too. Yeah, I lied. I did what I had to to get through this, this one last time. Mrs. Claus had finally agreed. We may look like two beached whales parked along the sandy shore this time next year, but we wouldn't be freezing our asses off in North Pole surrounded by ungrateful, collectively weaponized midgets holding guns to our pocket strings. Oops, I mean, talented little tiny fuckers. <laughs> I mean, um, indigenous natives who dig a little deeper and push a little harder, create a little quicker, wrapping gifts more efficiently, so we can all enjoy the day after Christmas and party like it's 2024 on New Year's Eve. I backed away from the microphone to the sound of tiny hands clapping from the joy of my empty promises. I had managed to BS the masses one more time. Mary Jane had been correct. I am the master of a lie with the wink of an eye. Now if I could make it through one more Christmas Eve without going postal, we'd pack up our crap and blow this pop stand and park our butts on a beach making sand angels instead of snow one. 
enjoying Mai Tais and sunshine. Hell, we may even try out some nude beaches. <laughs> I wink to myself. Four. The burn of the bourbon trickling down my throat felt perfect. I needed a few more snorts before I went out to give the BS pep talk to my hooved compadres. I attempted to picture each one of those moose-sized poop droppers as I continued to try and enjoy my maker's mark, picturing the waves rolling in as the sun morphed my stark white body into a bronze-colored retiree, wiggling my toes and listening to Mexican music instead of screaming, giggling kids while I visually undressed the already scantily clad beach babes with bodies sculpted for... Well... Chris Kringle, what are you doing sitting here schlepping down drinks while the clock is ticking down? A wifey just murdered my fantasy of what was to come. Would she kill my jam when we hit the beach too? Some rethinking of bringing her along may have to be thought through thoroughly while slave driving this upcoming night. Wouldn't that make the headlines? Mary Claus found deceased, strapped to her rocking chair with a note containing two simple words. Adios, muchacha. Nothing can kill a beautifully dreamscaped fantasy that a man is able to conjure up creating well-designed, naked, large-breasted females parading around and catering his every whim, more than a woman who knows your every weakness and physical insecurity. She broke into my dream again, but with more viciousness this time. Hey, lardass, I'm talking to you. Real earth to the Don Troll man with the sticky buns. You ain't on that beach yet, Urkeloins. I'm on it, dear. Just now, getting ready to talk to the beasts. Sell it, Santa. Sell it like it's beachfront property. Don't mess this up. I push through the stables with special bag of oats to pass around. I could see their weariness in their eyes. They were getting old, too. I wasn't sure magic grass would do it this year. Boys, Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, and Vixen... Comet, Cupid, Donner, and Blitzen, and, well, Rudolph. I smile. I always question if Prancer, Vixen, and Cupid were, you know, not he, she, dear. I mean, they did have antlers, but I digress. It's that time again. Tomorrow night is action night. It's our longest work day. I'm gonna just say... Go out tonight and enjoy a nice rack and rut, but save the final jelly roll for when you return. I need those sacks full tomorrow night, each and every one. I know we ain't getting any younger boys, but we're still stallions, and I'm counting on us this one last time. We're a team. Yeah, team. I don't see your sack swinging in the frigid mixture of snowflake Santa Claus. Donner, is that you again? I smiled as I twisted up a nicely rolled blunt and held it up to my lips before striking the match. This is your favorite blend, buddy. Pass that blunt. Pass that blunt. The room chanted to the clap of hooves. Don't bogart it, Donner. I smiled as he stepped up to the microphone, snorting and clomping. I inhaled one large toke until my lungs burst me into a coughing fit. I don't know if you ever heard twelve reindeer cackling in unadulterated laughter at your own cost, but I must say that it is highly addictive behavior. I don't care what people say about your cute little snow spots, guys. Your gay descriptive names, Prancer and Vixen, or your tougher macho Blitzen, you are all aces in my deck, boys. Wouldn't want a party with any other lower life forms than you. This brought on a wave of snorts. I know I've said this several times in the past years, but I'm about ready to retire to a beach somewhere. Somewhere with nearly naked women 
who wiggle in all the correct places carrying colorful umbrella drinks to guys like us. I'm going to need good drivers to get me and, and just maybe, maybe the missus there. Who is game? I laughed out loud. Ho, 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 get it? Game? Ha, <laughs> ha, I laughed again. Oh, Santa, you don't really mean it. Rudolph eked out. You shut the hell up, you traveling whorehouse welcome mad face. Rudolph's nose blinked on and off twice times too at my crass statement. I took another hit and pulled myself up close to Rudolph's face. Don't you say a word of this, or I'll crack that bulb for good. Better yet, I'll replace it with a low voltage LED in lime green, so you can look like you're puking all day and night. <coughs> I snorted and ended with another cough as puffs of smoke shot through my nose. Shh, is the word, little fur donkey. I'd hate to have to make meatloaf out of you. Mama Claus hears nothing about this conversation. I gotta admit, the smoke must have been good because little Rudolph's dim blinking red nose appeared like the front door of Frank's den of danger does on a cold frigid night when the girls inside are all hot, sassy, and sultry. I felt the smile of warmth overtake my chubby cheeks and steer me to fleshy places of warmth. Five. Have you ever been so deep in La La Land that every sound, no matter how loud and obnoxious it may be, quietly reverberated around the room like an echo chamber of soft and squishy pillow sounds? I swear I was hearing the wings of angels fluttering in my ears when I finally fought the urge to open my eyes to see what was a clatter. After all, it was the night before Christmas, and as I squinted through blurred eyes, I could assume that nary a creature was stirring. I was burrowed in between big, huge balls of fur and long hooved legs. And then, the back of my hand slipped and slid between something I never could have imagined in a thousand years. Warm and sweaty, far too toasty to feel natural against the backside of my hand. I believe Donner's eyes snapped to open every bit as quickly as mine. Suddenly felt like my hand was caught in the cookie jar with freshly baked dough balls. What the? I snapped as my hand shot quickly into my other. Is this what my life has come to? Partying until I was so messed up, I held no recall. My mind attempted to quickly backtrack through the last hours I had spent. My forehead became heated and flushed as rage grew quickly inside my psyche. I swear a flash went off across every garage wall that lit up like lightning. Then I heard the pitter-patter of tiny little legs with itty-bitty shoes scampering off through an open door. Was this a cruel joke my fellow four-legged sleigh crew had cooked up? Oh my head! I cried as I stammered to roll my body over and attempt to fight the urge to puke as the membranes of my skull throbbed in pounding pain. It was almost instantaneous that the reindeer and I were standing in wobbling motion attempting to decipher the moment. My hands cupped my skull as my eyes continued clearing the foggy blur from my watery eyes. This day was not jolly. It was supposed to be. It used to be. But it wasn't. Where was the missus? Had she let me spend the night in the garage as punishment for not listening? Not being the leader that I used to be and readying the troops for the mission? And my brain finally reached the melting point and slid down my throat in a state of, I don't know, intoxication of sorts? 
finally overloaded with so much pleasure from the job, had I had finally broken myself? I must admit that one hasn't truly come face to face with oneself until you find yourself blankly staring at a group of 12 reindeer you've just spent an evening getting stoned with to the point you are debating if you've fallen into another level of the void. I mean, who has ever done this before? I'm Santa, dammit! I create miracles every year! I can't even remember when it all started. What the hell just happened? My eyes searched each of the herds as they one by one turned away in shame only they could understand. We had failed this year. Was Christmas really done? I stormed out and headed directly to my bug out shelter. It must be Armageddon on the horizon. I'd seen it coming through the years. It was never big enough. Never enough gifts. Never joyful enough. People had become merely consumers. Me, me, me. The spirit had been mortally wounded for years. A slow bleed lulling us into ignoring its cries. Commercialism, corporatism, nationalism, Darwinism, speciesism. All of these damned isms. Maybe it's time to bring us all back down to bacteria, dirt, and rocks. <laughs> That's right, boys and girls. Santa woke up on the wrong side of the campfire this morning and isn't doing jolly today. I knew the whites around my eyes were far too big. I didn't need to look in the mirror to see the pressure of perfection had broken me this Christmas Eve. I couldn't believe I'd made it this long. The naughty list had far overtaken the nice one years ago. It started with the damned baby boomers. Sure, the traditionalists, or silent generation, weren't free from fault. But those damned boomers... I began loading magazines. My thoughts were no longer clear. Not that they really ever were. Jumbled and random thoughts bouncing around in my head like ladyfinger firecrackers exploding and bouncing from the interior walls of my head. Amazon gift cards, Best Buy, Walmart. Nobody wanted handcrafted elf toys anymore. They didn't even want cash. Too lazy to even go out and pick something out at a brick and mortar. Push a button on a keyboard and two days later it magically appears at your doorstep. How can old school tradition beat that? We bred our kids to want instantly begin the consumer craving earlier and earlier. You can't even get Halloween over with before corporate America begins shoving Black Friday and Cyber Monday down consumers' throats. Whatever happened to singing around the Yuletide fire? Cookies and candies baked by grandmothers with their grandchildren. I'm no innocent. I'm part of the problem. Hell, I just woke up jacked up from getting crazy ass lit up with my reindeers. I'm loading up magazines like I'm readying for World War III. And it's not even on an Xbox in first person POV. Are we even alive anymore? Or are we just burnt out brain matter and tissue hooked up into the matrix? Inside my head, the battle was real. It was as if the nukes had already been launched and I was merely readying myself for paybacks before it all ended. I couldn't tell you where it came from. Had someone spiked my weed? Or was it all the years of subliminally watching it all peel away from the onion with no one stepping up and calling it out? What was the point anymore? Where was Mary Jane? Whatever happened to Martha? You know it's five kinds of effed up when Santa Claus is on wife number two and forecasting what retirement will be like on a nude beach in Mexico when you're already about 300 years old. What sweet young thing wants any part of that train wreck? There can't be any girl with those kind of grandpa issues. 
I began to smile with uneasiness as I threw the rucksack full of ammo over my shoulder with a craving to go elf hunting like a sportsman shooting target clays. I don't even know why I was blaming the elves other than just telling myself they weren't real people, as if that made my thoughts okay. It all just seemed to make sense for the moment. Everything went white as snow. 6. The mayhem felt real. There were feelings involved. It's not every day that the man responsible for Christmas's last act of kindness and love for the year takes the turn it did this year. Nobody saw this one coming over the hill. It was actually brave of Rudolph to attempt lighting his way to warning the village. He gets an A in my book for his valiant efforts. Who would have ever thought he'd one day attempt to save Christmas all by himself? I can't say I really remember a whole lot. The night didn't seem to last like all the others have in the past. In fact, it seemed almost over before it ever began. I always wondered about regret. When you do nothing but good, there is, of course, no reasons for regret. But when you go rogue and take your vengeance out on what you can later tell yourself was innocence, well, that makes quite a quandary to contend with. If you have any humanity left inside of you at all, I know one rarely thinks about Santa Claus in any way other than the jolly fat guy dressed in red and white that brings joy to all in the middle of the night. If you really think hard about it though, what have you been teaching your kids all along? It's okay for a hot sweaty old dude to sneak into your house at night and eat your cookies as long as he leaves a pleasant surprise for you at the base of a dying tree in your living room. You gotta admit, it's already started out a bit on the twisted side of things. So, should one really expect something in that equation, can finally inadvertently go a little off the margin of acceptable? I'm no graduate from medical school. I'm just a guy who hangs out all through the year with little pointy-eared short people you deny even exist in any fashion other than a cold top secret world at the North Pole. You allow me into your homes one time a year where I'm allowed to get in any fucking way I can. A chimney, fire escape, a magic hole in your rooftop, while my overabundantly loaded sleigh with 12 400 pound plus reindeer land. And you don't even make any attempts to call the cops as long as the only missing stuff from your cozy home is a cup of milk and a cookie or two. And I'm the crazy one. You preach this story over and over, lying to your kids to lull them into a fantasy so unreal that even corporate America jumped on board because you're all so gullible they couldn't believe how easy it worked. You'll even sing songs about me and say, Merry Christmas, a hundred times each year before the actual day arrives. I gotta know one thing. This year, while I'm lying on the beach soaking in the rays, my beard shaved clean, my tattoos now very visible so I look nothing like that crazy bastard that lost his shit this year, what are you going to tell your kids? How can you voluntarily own up to this big happy lie that's been perpetrated on them to the point you have them denying that I'm not real and that I really do somehow break all laws of physics and logic and can indeed travel the world over in one single night to spread happiness and joy to a world that absolutely hates everyone in it on any other given day of the year? How do you do it? Or gonna do it? I'm at a loss here. I don't even know how I got to this beach. Did I crash from the sky on my sled and wash up here? It's like a dream I can't seem to remember. In fact, I can't even really feel anything. No fear, no pain, no happy or sad. Simply nothing. 
I just exist. I now wonder if I even did anything. All these questions that seem to just float in and out like butterflies. Christmas Day, 2024. KNBC Channel 4 breaking news here on what was earlier a very unnerving scene for many on Venice Beach's boardwalk. I'm Kit Bannix reporting to you live on scene here in Oceanside where an AR-15 wielding man began threatening to take shots. After police came on scene, the as of yet unnamed suspect did take two hostages and held them for several hours this morning in a surf rental shack. He claims he wiped out his North Pole toy factory along with Mrs. Claus. His further claims of his toy-filled sleigh being shot from the sky leaving him stranded here in California have not been substantiated. He had asked hostage negotiators to bring cookies and milk along with a quart of eggnog before he would be willing to release his hostages. SWAT teams surrounded the area and then stormed the shack once they realized his two hostages he claimed he was holding were merely wild dogs whom the deranged man claimed to be two of Santa's reindeer. Hang on. The information I was just given is being corrected. It seems the man SWAT apprehended was claiming that he is Santa Claus, and he is now apologizing for ending Christmas once and for all. What's that, Alex? He said, what? You're kidding me. Should I report this? Again, listeners, Kit Bannix with KNBC Channel 4 breaking news here on the Venice Beach Boardwalk on Christmas Day. It's being reported that a man has been apprehended after witnesses saw him with an AR-15 just before breaking into a surf rental shack. The suspect is claiming he is Santa Claus and is apologizing for wiping out his entire North Pole toy factory. He is claiming there are bodies of elves scattered throughout. We are going to go to break and report back as soon as this story can be substantiated. Cut the feed, Mitch. My God. Only in L.A. can a story like this cut into the holiday. I need a drink. Happy holidays, and yes, it's still a holly jolly Christmas. The best time of the year. I sure hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, The Night Santa Wasn't Jolly by Eli Pope. Eli Pope is a major writing contributor for Fear from the Heartland. Eli began his love of creating stories back in high school creative writing classes. The passion lay dormant for decades while life took him different directions. The stories never left and he finally succumbed to the voices in his head telling him to put them on paper. And put them on paper he did, earning the Literary Titan Award for all five books of the Mason Jar series. The Judgment Game, The Spark of Wrath, The Glass House, The Reclamation, and Snapshot Into a Killer's Mind, which you, dear listener, can hear on Audible.com, performed by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley. The only thing I will tell you, Billy J. Cater is a bad dude. You can hook up with Eli Pope at his website, elipope.com. That's Eli, E-L-I, Pope, P-O-P-E, dot com. He can also be located on Facebook at author Eli Pope, or search groups on Facebook, The Mason Jar Room. December of 1986 will be a pivotal time for several friends living in a small town in central Arkansas. They will discover there are forces beyond their wildest imagination working in the shadows, and once confronted, will change the course of their lives forever. And now for your indulgence, The Incident at Peeler Bend by Ashley Fontaine.
Saturday, December 20, 1986, 1045 p.m. Brett turns off Peeler Bend Road and onto the long dirt-covered driveway. The car's headlights illuminate a truck parked near the sagging front porch. The hunk of junk Chevy belongs to identical twins Carter and Kelvin Morrison. He holds in a sigh of disgust. Exhausted after a long shift stocking groceries at Food for Less for the Christmas rush, he's in no mood for yet another sleepless night listening to the Morrison brothers party with their cousin Timothy and his girlfriend Janine. For a split second, he regrets the decision to accept Timothy's offer of a place to live, but then checks himself. Living in the sticks inside a dump in the backwoods of Arkansas is better than freezing his ass off during brutal winters, wandering the streets of Michigan and being homeless. Which was the alternative? Glancing over at Lee, his jaw twitches. Tension oozes from her while she glares at the Chevy, looking like she's trying to set the truck ablaze with her mind, a la Charlie McGee in Firestarter. A raging headache thrums at his temples. The scraggly black and white stray dog, Bilbo Baggins, scrambles out from underneath the sagging underpinning of the trailer. He knows the poor creature hasn't had food or water since he and Lee left for work over ten hours prior since Bilbo is afraid of everyone but him. He shuts off the engine and opens the small bag of kibble liberated from work, courtesy of a five-finger discount. His auburn-haired Spitfire girlfriend never one for keeping opinions to herself, slams a fist on the dashboard. Are you kidding me? Not tonight. I'm exhausted. We didn't sign up to take care of Tim's deliverance relatives, too. No, we didn't. When the twins get loaded, they eat everything their meaty paws can grab. Opening the driver's door, he smiles while Bilbo gingerly eats the dog food straight from his outstretched hand. He's drawn to the mutt, since the two of them are alike. Both have no place of their own and are struggling each day to survive in a cruel world that doesn't care if they live or die. I'm sick of them too, but right now, we don't have a choice. Still short 300 for the deposit on the apartment and utilities, it will take another two months to save that much. I can't take another two weeks. The agreement was a 50-50 split, not 100. He decides to shift the topic toward a new direction. He detests arguing, especially with Lee. I had no place to go after my parents died and my tour in the Marines ended. If it weren't for Timothy, I'd have never set foot in Arkansas which means we wouldn't have met and fallen in love. So we owe him. We've more than paid that debt. He's taking advantage of the situation after my parents gave me the ultimatum. But you picked the option to be with me inside this dump, which made your parents hate me. True love, right, babe? We aren't talking about my parents and they don't hate you. They hate the fact I bailed on college to work at McDonald's. You know, once we get on our feet, I plan on taking some classes. Oh, I see what you're doing. No, you don't get to change the subject. Things were a little different when I first moved in. Janine contributed, but after she lost her job, the situation did a 180. Why she puts up with Tim's bullshit is beyond my comprehension. He's lazy, hung over most days, and has morphed into a fat slob. So disgusting. Uh, Janine could find another job, but she's using the pregnancy as an excuse not to work. Says the man who's not carrying a watermelon on his gut 24-7, Janine is not why I'm upset. The job of the HUD who shares her bed makes me livid. She shares his bed. This is his home, not hers. If she feared getting pregnant, she should have been on the pill, like you. Condoms break. I can't believe you said that. Stop making excuses for him. Tim has no self-respect or concern for anyone, not even himself or where he lives. 
as he care he's about to become a father and his child will grow up in a trailer that is literally falling apart? No. When she has the baby, what are they going to do then? Depend on us to buy formula, diapers, and clothes? Who will keep the place clean? Neither of them lifts a finger to help now, so I don't even want to imagine what a pigsty will turn into once she pops out the kid. Timothy cares. He's just overwhelmed. It's only been 11 months. He's still adjusting to civilian life and grappling with some major mental baggage. I read an article once that said, highly intelligent people sometimes experience bouts of depression or mood disorders, especially when they aren't doing something to stimulate their brains. Yeah, yeah, I know. Tim's a genius. So what? That's no excuse. In fact, his high IQ means he should know better. He needs a job to stimulate his brain. He didn't leave the military on his own accord. He was dishonorably discharged. Had he been a good soldier, he'd have gotten VA benefits, including health care. But no, he had to go get busted dealing weed on base. Loser. His head whips round. Lee's callous response infuriates him, but then remembers she's just 19 and only knows what they told her about why they are no longer jarheads. Is that how you view me too? A loser? I'm in the exact same boat from the exact same incident. At least Tim's parents left him this place, so he has something I don't. I have no home, no car, a dead-end job, no family left alive, and no military benefits. Sounds like you've swallowed what your father said. You broke their hearts for a nobody. Tears well up in her green eyes. She averts her gaze to the bags of cold hamburgers and fries at her feet. Of course not. And you and Tim are not the same. You work and care about your future. About our future. He's content with being a lazy lump who stuffs his face with food paid for by others and sleeping off yet another bender. Like I said, loser. Anger licks up his spine. I'm impressed by your ability to know the internal thoughts and motivations of others. You enjoy riding that high horse of superiority your rich daddy set you upon at birth, yet you sling hamburgers and fries, only have a high school diploma, and are now trailer trash like the rest of us. Low blow, Brett. Stop twisting things around and being mean to me. If he wants to waste his life living like this, fine. That's his choice. But his life isn't just his own now. He needs to think about the safety and health of his child and the woman he claims to love. Janine's car is on its last legs. What will they do when it falls apart? It's beyond time for him to man up and take care of the mountain of responsibilities adulthood brings. Ah, who am I kidding? He will never change. And neither will Kelvin and Carter. All three of them are moochers from the same family tree. They have no shame or goals other than getting loaded and playing D&D. They're obsessed with living in a fantasy world and fighting things that don't exist, like that Demi thing. He almost mentions the Demogorgon Timothy created is a worthy adversary and fun to battle. But refrains. She's on a fiery tirade. His previous snarky retort acted like gas on top of the pyre, and now nothing he says will dampen the explosion. He should have kept his mouth shut. I'm so over this. You promised living here would be temporary. Four months ago. You promised. We need our own space and peace and quiet. Now. Not two months. Not two weeks. Now. Janine's in her last trimester. I will not be here when she gives birth. The baby is not our responsibility, and you know if we stay, they will both try and make us feel bad for their situation, and we'll give in and be stuck here until their offspring turns 18. I love you, and I gave up a lot to be with you. So now it's time you do the same. Your choices are simple. Leave with me, or remain here with the hillbilly clan. She snatches the keys from the ignition and bolts out of the car, leaving the bags of food. 
He agrees with most of what she said but cannot bring himself to reply. She nearly rips the screen door from its hinges and barges inside, bursting past a bewildered Timothy before he steps out onto the porch. The former jarhead is changed since they got kicked out of the core, to the point Brett barely recognizes him. Without conscious effort, his fingers immediately find the dimpled scars on the side of his neck. His stomach roils when the memories of the night he obtained the injury rush back. Maybe he should tell Lee the truth. No, the thought of reliving the horrors of that night makes him shudder. Besides, he and Timothy vowed to never speak of what happened again, and he is a man of his word since he literally has nothing else to call his own. Bilbo growls before turning and running down the old logging road. Brett watches until he disappears, wondering what animal got the normally docile dog riled up. Chills sprout across his arms when he notices the left side of the forest is completely covered in a thick rolling fog and the right is crystal clear. Weird. Timothy wobbles down the stairs and greets him. Black hair must, scruffy beard dotted with what he suspects are potato chips and clothes disheveled. He's gained at least 50 pounds since leaving the Marines and when within 10 feet, rank body odor drifts across the expanse. Under the silvery rays of moonlight, his features appear maniacal. Dude, about time you got home. Come on, the boys brought us an early Christmas present. Oh yeah? What? Brett walks over to the passenger side, grabs the bags, and shuts the door. A fridge full of groceries? Mellow yellow blotters, dude. And I'm telling you, the stuff is righteous. It's just starting to kick in, and I can tell this trip will be epic. You need to catch up. As usual, I'm DM tonight and worked all day on setting up an amazing adventure. The others need Pulsar the Warrior to lead them into... You dropped acid? Brett interrupts, stunned by the revelation. Timothy nods, looking slightly confused. Please tell me Janine didn't. Of course she did. The mind expansion will afford her the ability to delve into bonding with the baby. Can you imagine what she'll learn about a child in utero when able to communicate with it? You know I don't subscribe to the theory children are tabula rasa. Their minds are full of the mysteries of the universe, not blank slates. Janine will be able to... Enough! Brett cuts him off, stomping toward the house. Timothy is right on his heels. Pausing at the front door, he spins around until within millimeters of his friend's nose, using his larger stature to his advantage. The porch light reveals dilated pupils and sweat pouring down his face. Yep, he's rolling hard now, and it isn't the first time Timothy's been blotto. But to his knowledge, the first for Janine. Disgust and disappointment congeal with anger. He lowers his voice so the others inside cannot hear. What little respect I had for you both is gone. She's pregnant. Lee's right. It's time to go. Immediately. If you wake either of us tonight... I swear you'll regret it. Spread the word to the other idiots inside. Without giving Timothy a chance to respond, Brett steps inside, throws the bags of food onto the kitchen counter, and sneers at the twins and Janine sitting in between them on the threadbare couch. The trio are so engrossed in their drug-induced conversation, they don't even notice he entered the room. He rips the stereo cord from the back of the unit and lets it drop to the floor, and then tromps down the cramped hallway, slamming the door to the bedroom with enough force the thin wood splinters. Lee is curled into a ball on the edge of the bed, crying silent tears into a pillow. He eases over and sits next to her, slowly stroking her curly hair, noticing 
She's clinging on to her purse crammed full of the money they've saved like she always does when the Morrison twins are around. Despite her temper, he does care about her and the thought of her not being at his side for the rest of his life makes a knot of concern rumble in his stomach. Dry those tears, babe. I heard them gabbing about the mind trip they're on, feeling and tasting the colors all around them, connecting with the universe, seeing inanimate objects moving around on their own. Only one drug I know of fucks with the head like that. LSD. And that breaks my heart for the baby. Timothy wants you to roll too, doesn't he? Yes, but I decline. Lee may be young, but she's highly intuitive and smart. I won't do this anymore, Brett. I refuse to sit around and watch them sink further and further into depravity. Remaining here means I condone the behavior, and I don't. Besides, the place has fallen apart. I'm going to call in sick tomorrow, pack my clothes, take my car, and beg my mother for the rest of the money to get the apartment. She'll cave. It's almost Christmas. I'm done watching and living inside this shit show. Please come with me before you end up trapped here. Gathering her trembling torso into his arms, he pulls her close, shushing her with gentle kisses on her sweaty forehead. Tonight was the last straw for me, too. I promise, we will leave tomorrow. Don't involve your parents. I'll get my boss to give me a loan in exchange for working double shifts. Remember, I just got a raise to five bucks an hour, so I'll be able to work it off quickly. She sniffs. You already did that once and Jefferson said no. He won't change his mind. Shh, stop worrying. I promise you, babe, by Monday, we'll be in our own place. Sunday, December 21, 1986, 2.45 a.m. Brett's neck burns as if someone jabbed him with a red-hot poker. He is in a bright, cold place naked, and limbs and torso bound with what feels like thick leather straps. Panic wells up inside his chest when he tries to move, but cannot. The light is so intense it hurts his eyes. An unfamiliar, foul odor like sulfur mixed with rotted flesh permeates his nasal cavity. Did someone burn him? Is that the smell? Burnt flesh? Low murmurs in a strange, unfamiliar language seemingly come from every direction. Several times, something cold, clammy, and slightly damp touches different parts of his torso, and despite being a big, tough jarhead, whimpers bubble in the back of his parched throat. He has no idea where he is, how he got there, or who is holding him captive. The burning sensation spreads throughout his entire body like his heart is a volcano pumping liquid fire through his veins instead of blood. When it reaches his toes, the burning ceases and his flesh turns numb, reminding him of when he was seven and fell into the lake by his childhood home after getting lost in a blizzard. He screams for help, but the gag in his mouth muffles the sound. The lights suddenly go out and darkness engulfs him. Feral panic overtakes rational thought. There's movement from every direction and a weird slithering sound rather than distinct footsteps. The voice drifts further away until all noise ends, leaving him trapped inside an ebony abyss of nothingness. His sense of time is skewed, but it seems like a significant amount passes before he hears a groan from the right. His blood pressure spikes to the point where he fears his head will explode. Every breathing and grunting are next, followed by the smack of bare skin hitting the floor and halting footsteps. Brad, are you okay? Relief floods his soul. The voice belongs to PFC Timothy Osborne, and hearing him brings a deluge of memories flooding back. The skeezy bar Timothy dragged him to off the base. Without a pass, 
and accepting the risk of being AWOL if caught. Shot after shot to drown out the pain of losing his parents and the harsh truth, he is alone in the world. Timothy's encouraging slurred words and generous offer to return to Arkansas with him when their tour of duty ends because like him, they both are orphans. Stumbling into the filthy bathroom, puking, returning to the table and downing a fresh shot of tequila Timothy ordered, and then waking up here, wherever here is. Brad, Timothy's voice is raspy. Can you hear me? Taking a deep breath through his nose, Brett forces the air from his lungs, but what comes out is nothing more than a muffled groan. Cold, strong fingers latch onto his arm. That you? Brett moans again. Hang on. In seconds, Brett is free from the shackles and gag. Overcome with a bout of nausea, he turns his head and retches harder than he ever has in his life. When finished, he tries sitting up, but his muscles refuse to cooperate. Where are we? Who kidnapped us? Why? Dude, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Come on, now's our chance to escape. I can't walk. Fucking great. Timothy hoists Brett's body over his shoulder. Keep your eyes closed no matter what you hear and don't make a sound. Nod once if you understand. Brett nods. The foul stench from earlier fills the air at the exact moment the slithering sound returns. He has no choice but to put his life, literally, into the hands of a man he's only known for less than a year. The stench intensifies, enveloping every part of his being, invading his nostrils, skin, and embedding inside his core. Miraculously, Timothy finds the door in the darkness and opens it, yet loses his grip and Brett's body crashes onto the hard floor. Something cold and damp grabs his arm. Despite Timothy's earlier instructions, Brett's eyes fly open and finds himself staring into a pale cadaverous face with black eyes full of rage. Sharp, elongated teeth extend down to the chin and frothy goo dribbles from the mouth. A long, flaming red tongue darts out, licking the gunk from cracked, thin lips. He's not the religious type, yet feels evil radiating from the non-human creature. Time freezes while locked in the menacing gaze, and he instinctively knows the thing desires more than destroying his flesh. It craves his soul. His touch with reality snaps. A roar of terror bursts from his lips. Primal fear wakes up his arms, and his hands seek out the long, slender neck and squeeze. Blinding pain explodes from his groin. Brett cradles his busted balls, writhing in agony. The sweet scent of obsession perfume mixed with jasmine and lilac washes over him, and despite the intense pain, he's relieved because it means he's awake and the nightmare over. The odor of sulfur and burned skin is gone. Rather than sporadic bits and pieces of his usual nightmare, he relived every vivid detail. You bastard! Opening his eyes, and even though it is dark, save for a small nightlight behind her, he can see Lee's terrified. What did I do? She leans across the bed, turns on the small lamp, and rubs her neck before rising and yanking on clothes. You were choking me. I couldn't breathe or scream because you cut off my air supply. Why did you try to kill me? I love you. So why did you try to kill me? Babe, I'm sorry. I was having a nightmare. Join the club. Living in this shithole for months has been the worst and longest nightmare imaginable. I'm done with everything, including you. Clothes be damned. I'll have my wealthy parents buy me more. I'm going home. Before Brett has a chance to beg and plead, the shrill scream pierces the night air. 
both their heads jerked toward the small window facing the dark forest. Despite the radiating pain in his groin, he stands, putting himself between Lee and the danger lurking outside. Bray, wake up! Timothy bursts through the bedroom door, gasping for air and nearly face plants before steadying himself. His ripped clothes are dotted with patches of blood, and his cheek sports what looks like something scratched deep into the facial tissue. Lee gasps from the other side of the bed. Brett glowers at him. What the fuck is going on? The woods, dude, about one click from here. It's got Janine, Calvin, and Carter. I barely escaped. We're wasting time. Hurry. Lee storms past him, purse and keys in hand, and stops in front of Timothy. I'm not interested in listening to your drug-induced hallucination. Get out of my way, or I swear my knee will shove your balls into your throat and you'll choke on them. I'm not hallucinating, Lee, I swear, Timothy wails, tears streaming down his cheeks. We must save them, please. It found us, Brett. I don't know how, but it fucking found us. Brett stares into Timothy's terrified countenance, and fear jolts up his back. In a split second, everything becomes crystal clear, and he realizes how much he loves Lee and the thought of her in danger makes his blood boil. He grabs her arm and spins her around. He's telling the truth. You wait in the car. I'm not leaving them. Lee gapes at him like he's lost his mind, and truthfully, he wonders the same. He pulls on a pair of jeans and sweater before opening the nightstand and removing the 357 and a box of bullets. In seconds, he fills the pockets with extra rounds. You're going out there? Are you insane? Let's just drive to the neighbor's house and call the police. If someone would have paid the telephone bill, we'd have a phone. Lee's terrified yet furious gaze darts over to Timothy and then back to his. Janine's pregnant, remember? I can't just leave her or the others, babe. Even if you do leave and call the police, it won't matter. What's waiting out there is nothing short of pure evil. He moves closer and strokes her soft cheek, praying the tender touch conveys his feelings. Timothy and I encountered it before, and apparently... It followed us here from North Carolina. That horrible incident is how I got the scar on my neck. And what I was dreaming about before you woke me up. It's also the reason we got ourselves kicked out of the military and fled here. I'm positive now the foul creature bit me. Lee blinks several times. Her face turns deadly pale. Please tell me you dropped acid after I went to sleep because... That's the only thing that makes sense right now. You can't be sober and serious. I wish I was high or still dreaming, but I'm sober and wide fucking awake. Timothy saved my life that night from whatever that blood-sucking thing is. Now you understand why I owe him and why I won't flee like a coward when people he loves are in danger. Another round of Bilbo's throaty barks makes his heart thump. Lee... Get to the car. Now. Dude, hurry. Timothy pleads from the doorway. Lee grabs his arm. In movies and books, the one separated from the crowd always dies. Always. If you think I'm staying here alone, you're out of your fucking mind. Timothy leads the trio with Brett in the middle and Lee two steps behind him. In silence, guided by silvery moonbeams, they jog up the logging road and reach the top of a hill before Timothy veers left and enters the foggy forest. In less than ten minutes, they've traveled over half a mile and haven't heard a sound except their footfalls and heaving breathing. Even nocturnal animals are quiet, which is nerve-wracking. Brett's sharp gaze sweeps across the area for any signs of movement, yet he sees nothing other than trees with gnarled bare branches on both sides and soupy mist on the left. The fog is cold and winds around their legs, making it impossible to see their feet. Lee stumbles twice, and each time 
Britt grabs her arm and steadies her before continuing forward. Regret at the decision to let her come coils in his guts while paranoia pounds in his chest. Stopping, he turns to face her. Just as he opens his mouth to instruct her to flee until reaching the car and drive until running out of gas, Timothy disappears over a small rise. Brett's hit with the coppery odor of blood, sulfur, and something burning. His nerves go into overdrive. A hand flies to Lee's mouth. She smells it too. Edging closer, she whispers, Something's not right, Brett. I feel it. We need to go back. Now. A low whine to the right makes the hairs on his body stand. He cannot see the ground, but it doesn't matter. He knows it is Bilbo. Squatting down, he feels around until his hand touches hot, sticky blood and matted cold fur, along with the final heartbeat of the sweet dog's life. Is it Bilbo? Lee whispers, Yes, he's gone. Damn it. Oh my God! Timothy wails, Janine! No! Brett and Lee race up the hill only to find an incomprehensible scene that stops both in their tracks. The foggy soup vanishes as though it was never there. Less than 10 feet from their position is an open glen bathed in silvery moonlight. Timothy cradles Janine's lifeless body, rocking back and forth, sobbing uncontrollably. Brett can tell her neck was slashed and now her head is only attached by a few strips of flesh, lolling around until it detaches from the movement and tumbles in their direction, momentum only stopped by a large rock when within five feet of their position. The corpses that had once been the Morrison twins lay in a crumpled heap less than ten feet to his left, each sporting two puncture marks on their necks and so pale they are nearly translucent. Lee's piercing scream from his right makes his ears ring. Time seems to slow while something clicks inside his mind. He recognizes the scene from one he conjured in his head on the last D&D adventure when his character, Pulsar the Warrior, slayed the Demogorgon alone after it slaughtered Janine, Carter, and Calvin. The scar on his neck throbs in time with his racing heart. Terror seizes his soul. Either he's still trapped inside the nightmare, or somehow, Timothy slipped him a blotter while sleeping, perhaps on his tongue or exposed skin, because there is no way this is reality. Lee's body arcs over his head, landing in an unconscious heap in front of Timothy with a loud thud. His touch with sanity snaps, and he's consumed with desperation to save her. An unseen force coils around his body, making it impossible to move. Mmm. There's nothing more delicious than draining the life force from humans when they are intoxicated and filled with terror. Little Janine lost her head when I revealed what I really am and the monster inside her belly. Timothy's voice booms across the expanse, but it sounds all wrong, deep, dark, powerful. Timothy's body shudders, morphing into the creature that's haunted his dreams for nearly a year until standing over nine feet tall. He gapes at the pale, cadaverous face with black eyes, elongated teeth, and a long, flaming red tongue. The stench of sulfur is so strong he gags, This time, a gray robe is draped over the entire torso, floating with an almost ethereal grace, wisps of fog curling around the edges. It looks down at him and smiles. The combination is exquisitely satisfying, especially when starving. I haven't fed since I took a nibble of you in North Carolina. I intended to devour you, but the second I sunk my teeth into you and saw your future changed my mind. It's time for a new form, a new sex. 
It has been ages since I've lived as a young, beautiful, and very wealthy female. Oh, I do enjoy being summoned by the silly game you humans concocted, because it affords me the opportunity to seek out my next victim. Brett's rendered mute from shock. Tears sprint down his cheeks. Wake up, idiot. Wake the fuck up. The thing casts his gaze onto Lee. Her limb body rises, stopping one directly in front of its mouth. Don't look so dejected, Brett Christopher Jenkins. Your name's going to be on the lips of countless mortals for years. Known for sacrificing yourself to take down the vicious killer Timothy Osborne. The night he slaughtered his cousin's impregnant girlfriend in a drug-induced frenzy. I'll make sure Lee spins quite a horrifying tale and touts your valiant efforts. Bolts of lightning skitter across the sky as Lee's head tilts back. A swirling mass of gray mist shoots from the creature's mouth, streaming directly into Lee's. When the mist disappears, Timothy's body reappears and is violently thrown to the ground. Brett hears the disgusting sound of bones cracking. In stunned horror, he watches as Lee's eyes fly open. She turns her head and smiles while floating slowly back to the ground. With a slight nod of her head, his right arm raises and aims directly at Timothy's head. He's sobbing now, begging his mind to take control of his body, but the power emanating from what once had been Lee is too strong. His finger involuntarily pulls the trigger, destroying Timothy's head. Lee cracks her neck while gliding across the ground until at his side. Getting used to such a rudimentary shell is always challenging. I'm afraid we've arrived at your death scene. Such a tragic, tragic ending for the man I loved. After stumbling upon such a nightmare and having to kill your friend, your frail human heart couldn't handle the stress. Blinding hot pain explodes inside his chest. He collapses to the ground, gasping for air, clutching his left arm, mind shattered, and heart decimated as the thing that previously had been the woman he loved blows him a kiss, turns, and bolts into the darkness, screaming for help. Hope you enjoyed tonight's story, The Incident at Peeler Bend by Ashley Fontaine. Ashley Fontaine is a major writing contributor to Fear from the Heartland. Ms. Fontaine is an international best-selling author and has penned over 23 works in numerous genres. Her works can be found on Audible.com as well, including the first two books of the Legion novella series, narrated by me. To find more of her excellent work, check out her website at ashleyfontaine.net. That's Ashley. A-S-H-L-E-Y Fontaine F-O-N-T-A-I-N-N-E dot net or connect with Ashley on Facebook at Ashley dot Fontaine. If you enjoyed tonight's story hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P-A-U-L-S-B-O-O-K-S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, 
Our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a five-star review, and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd really appreciate it. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland.